We were told that a free market principle would allow money to flow freely into all the right places for all the right reasons. Um, but actually one third of the wealth of this world is now held in offshore tax havens. Um, the model doesn't work. And what we've seen is since the global financial crisis and even before that, the, you know, the middle class has stalled around the world. That's really, really dangerous. It's politically and socially dangerous. I and mean, even when I wrote No Straight Lines in 2000, and, well, published in 2011, I said, we are at the adaptive edge of our industrial society and we face Houston, a major design challenge. And if we don't fix it, then something really, really bad is going to happen, which is why the book was called No Straight Lines, right? Making sense of our nonlinear world. And here we are in a very, very nonlinear world. So we either get on with the business of regenerating planet and societies, um, respecting diversity and all of those things, or in fact, actually, we don't actually have a very good um, outcome. <laughs> Alan Moore is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Alan is the author of the best-selling Do Design, Why Beauty is Key to Everything, and he has written a new and timely business book for our post-COVID world, Do Build, and I've got it right here. Um, <clears throat> Business is changing. The single pursuit of profit at any cost has been replaced by a desire to build companies that create a better future and enjoy commercial success. Alan is a designer and business innovator on a mission to help businesses discover their own unique beauty. He mentors teams and individuals, delivers leadership programs, and advises clients on regenerative business practices. He has collaborated with companies and institutions all over the world, including PayPal, Microsoft, Xero, and MIT. Do Design, as his old book, came out in 2016 with over 20,000 copies sold. He has spoken at South by Southwest, the Hay Literary Festival, and the Do Lectures. In Do Build, the new book, Alan draws on his years of research in some of the most pioneering and progressive businesses on the planet. By speaking to their purpose-driven founders, he discovers that it is possible to lead with generosity, have a transparent supply chain, design products and services that are considered and joyful, and create a company culture where individuals flourish. By sharing these wonderful examples of best practice, Moore invites us to create a different type of business, one that will regenerate and restore our economy and our environment and our civilizations. Alan, it is so wonderful to have you here on the show. Thanks for coming. Great, Mark. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I am too. This is great. So just for my listeners, uh, our past should have crossed many times, but we have a mutual friend, Harold Neidhart of MLove and Future IO Institute, and, and uh, he and I travel and do different things all over the world, and somehow we're, we're connected through him. You spoke at his MLove events uh, uh, in 2009 at, at the castle, and um I don't think I was there in 2009. That was still the old castle, the kind of a very, very uh, roughing at camping type of a castle area. I, I came into uh, Harold a little bit later with the Haile Gidam Castle, which is up on the, the North Shore of, um, of Germany. And, um, but, but somehow, and we, we've been at South by Southwest as well, but somehow I think our paths crossed I had both of your books, and, and as minute that in March is when your new book, Do Build, came out. I immediately bought it, got it, read it. Um, I also follow Paul Hawken a, a lot as well, and so I, I saw that he'd given you a nice mention in, in, in the beginning, kind of that um, unbelievable read, but it's also very much in alignment with what I've read in the past. Uh, uh, Paul Hawkins' original books are very much in the same, same movement, very beautiful, a lot about regenerative business, a lot about 
doing things differently with purpose and happiness and beauty. Um, having said all this of, of, of how we kind of came together and came into this, you've been doing this, and I don't know if people can gather that out, out of my introduction in your biography for a while. You've been on this path, and, and you originally told me you met Harold through the mobility and innovation and kind of thinking about business in other ways and what's the, what's the better future that we can design for ourselves. Has any of that helped you to deal with this craziness, this crazy time we've been in, pandemics? I mean, hell, you wrote a book during during this time and at, just launched it this month. So how, how has that been? Um, I mean, I think with with everybody, uh, it was a real shock to the system, the, 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 the pandemic, the lockdown. I mean, I can remember actually when they... Um, we first went into lockdown and I went to the supermarket and uh, I was kind of, I don't know, I was pretty cool with it all. And I can remember sort of going to go in the front door of the supermarket. And then all of a sudden this guy says, no, you have to go around the side. And I went, oh yeah, of course. All right. I understand that one way system. And I remember walking around the side and this was a big, uh, a, a big yeah, supermarket car park. And then I kind of just panned from left to right to see how long the queue was that was going all around. And that was like, that was a really weird moment where the world looks the same, but you know that it's tilted fundamentally on its axis. And I can remember going into the shop and I mean, this was all before, you know, we had to wear masks and all the rest of it, but social distancing was there. And just watching how people were reacting to each other you know some people were getting way too close some people were running down the other end of the aisle you know and i can remember coming out of that and going oh my god the world has changed um and i made a big joke about it um i mean psychologically it was really tough um uh, and i can't really put my finger on why um, all I can say is, is that I live in a small village just outside of Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge is a stone's throw from where I live, pretty much. Um, uh, but on the, if I walk out of the village on the left-hand side, I can walk into the Fen, um, into the countryside, and, you know, my walks are like two, two to two and a half hours every day. My God, you know, if I didn't have that as a sort of opportunity, then um, to do that, I don't know what I would have done, to be honest with you. Um, and that said, I think that um, I don't know, I kind of hear some other people's stories and things, and as much as it, it was, was really challenging for, for us, I kind of sort of look back and think, well, maybe I'm a bit more resilient than I realise I am, you know, and yes, in the middle of all of that, we were busy working on the book, and perhaps in some respects, that was, you know, that was a saviour, because it was something to really focus on. I mean, the, the work was already well advanced in its development and its writing, but you know, Miranda, who's my publisher at uh, the Do Book Co, fantastic uh, human being, fantastic publisher. Um, you know, we really kind of work very hard to create a great product, which I'm very proud of, actually. So, yeah, there you go. That was uh, that was yeah. that was lockdown for the last 12 months. Did, did um, so obviously you saw this, uh, this, this going on and kind of uh, had, had this form of resilience. I, I know like in, in certain places where it doesn't snow that often, the first snowstorm, everybody's kind of like running off the roads, learning to drive again for the first time in snow or kind of, you know, there's this, this first time for the, for the pandemic, for many of us, this is like a, a total shock that people don't know what to do. Do you run and buy out all the toilet paper, all the, the, the preservatives and canned goods, you know, uh, there's, there, you know, what door do you go in? Do you have to wear a mask, social distancing? There's all these new things, but there are some models. And, and this is kind of where, uh, in, in some respects, I'm leading you in both of your books. One, you talk about craftsmen, designers, people who build uh, businesses and products and things that are just have purpose and beauty in them. And they're well thought out and they're, 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 um, yeah, they make a profit on them, but they're designed for a much greater purpose. They're, they're designed uh, in a different way. And with that thinking and those models in mind, did, did you, did, is, there, is there a model that 
we could have been dealing with uh, or living either regenerative or sustainable models that really are better apt at, at helping you weather such type of situations, whether it's pandemics or Black Lives Matters or Brexit or inaugurations, whatever it is, or, or do you did you not really realize that? Or, or how, what are your thoughts or feelings on that? Well, I mean, I've held that point of view for a very long period of time. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, my, you know, the work breaking that down in terms of what you're, uh, what you're asking and exploring is, is that I've always described myself as a designer, as well as a business innovator, but I've also described myself as a craftsman. Um, you know, my, my journey into that was through book design. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk about the, the holy trinity of the hand, the heart and the mind of the craftsman. Uh, so that means that your work is meaningful, you're very engaged with the work you do, it gives you purpose, um, and actually a lot more things than that, um, in terms of the rewards of uh, the work that you are creating and how you're work working. But equally, this principal idea for me, which is the craftsman, craftswoman, craftsperson, their work is in service to the greater good. Their work is to all society, you know, and that to me is like whether you're baking bread, you're making books, you know, the traditional acts of the craft. But in a sense, this work was actually for more than just uh, profit in, in many senses. It's a form of sharing. Your skill set is a form of sharing. And I'd always really held on to that. And as I sort of moved from, uh, you know, as a young man, that world into the world of um, graphic design and then into advertising um, and then got known as someone that could take on from very challenging innovation projects in a whole variety of different ways as the digital world kind of, you know, really started to sort of, you know, disrupt uh, the analog world. I mean, right back in the sort of, you know, the middle nineties and things. Um, that uh, that idea of growth and exponential growth really kind of clashed with my with my value set. Um, there's also a wider health belief in terms of how we see each other as human beings, how we see each other in terms of our sense in the world, um, and those things were also really uh, important to me. Um, and so I sense that, that that work then naturally flowed into this idea of beauty, which we can talk about in terms of how that came about and what that means. But uh, the word regeneration is very much um, in there as an idea and a principle. And I suppose what made me deeply sad was is that the pandemic is a, a man-made creation. Um, now, some folks may want, don't want to disagree with that, but the reality is, is that in the uh, exponential cutting down of um, our rainforests, forests, planets, whatever, um, the way that we farm the land, uh, we are putting ourselves up against um, a whole set of you know, viruses and whatever else, which will be deeply damaging to us. We've been disrespectful um, of the planet for growth, for growth's sake. And I've always said that, you know, the pursuit of profit at all and any cost will ultimately cost us everything if we're not careful. Um, and I really hope that the pandemic has uh, asked people to look into the abyss and just see how bad it can be if we're not respectful of each other or the planet that we, that we live on. And I think the other part to that, speaking purely from a British perspective, is watching our leadership in government um, not listen to the science. Um, you know, the Cheltenham race course, when a quarter of a million people were, you know, meant to or invited to go to watch a bunch of horses run around a, a field because that was good for business, um, shows to me the idiocy um, of how this has been approached. And so what you've got is, is an ideology about growth and about profit and economics, which means that we've damaged uh, our economy much, much more by what we've, what we've done rather than actually sitting down and saying, so what do we need to do to create a more regenerative or resilient response to the pandemic? Now that's far wide and you know, wide, wide ranging, but absolutely, I think that um, 
we need a massive reset um, in terms of what is growth, what is profit, what do we measure? Um, surely well-being should be part of that conversation, you know, so the, the, the sort of values and the metrics of what I call a regenerative economy really need to be fundamentally rethought. Um, I know that I'm not the only one asking that question at the moment. In, in both of your books, and specifically, you know, in Do Designed uh, About Beauty, um, Beauty and Everything, mm. uh, um, I really like the way you write because you're, you're talking, you're giving us good examples of businesses who've applied it and, and, and ways that it's going positive. Um, and it's, it, you're, you're, it's all science-based, it's fact-based, it's, uh, um, but you, you don't go into more about the evangelizing or the preaching about the sustainability and, and, and this reason because of that, really, it's more about here's these beautiful examples and, and the returns that you get is, is the way I read it. Um, maybe I have a different lens when I read it. Um, instead of harping on, we need to do this, we need, you know, in the doom and gloom, it's more about these positive, beautiful stories and what, what comes out of them and, and, and the different works that, that, I, mm. that I like a lot. But I'd love for you to kind of tell us a little bit more how, about the beauty and, and that process. Sure. And then we'll go into the next book. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, the story comes about from a very personal journey. I mean, I'd sort of, um, you know, I'd ended up, I started off in book design and I ended up sort of, you know, running some, as I say, some massive, you know, big innovation projects around the world, uh, developing products and services, um, helping people, big companies think strategically in terms of how they move forward, um, helping to bring those uh, to the world. Uh, even developing uh, patent strategies um, for a bunch of different companies, um, one which ultimately was sold to Apple. And, and then all of a sudden, I kind of went, this work is not making sense to me. And I feel a long way from home is uh, the best way that I can describe it. And the story, which I've told many times now, but I'm very happy to, to tell again, because this is, this is where it all starts, because I want to make the point that this is not something that I thought was a, you know, cool, hip and groovy thing to do, um, was actually being in that very lost place and asking that question of myself. Um, you know, I end up uh, as a seven year old boy uh, on a beach in Cornwall on a family holiday. Um, and um, my mum was always a very kind of stressed and anxious person. I think that was partly to do with um, uh, family uh, childhood. Uh, and um, and trauma. Um, also, I think that she was an anxious person, perhaps anyway, and she also worried, you know, how do we put food on the table every day? Um, and it was just sheer joy, as I remember this memory of watching almost a, a, a almost completely different human being, being this carefree, you know, fun-loving person on the beach. And unfortunately, you know, when my mum got very anxious, it made me very anxious. So there was a very kind of, you know, it's a very tight knit kind of thing going on there. Um, my father was a beautiful human being. He never earned a huge amount of money in his life, but he always worked. He worked with his hands. Um, uh, and he was a very kind and loving human being, always up for a laugh, always up for a game, always playful, always there for us. And so to watch them two together, was great like that with my brothers and my sisters. Um, you know, that that was all uh, wonderful. And I remember I was playing with my toys and um, and I thought, you know, the I'm at one with uh, those that I love the most. Um, I'm at one with myself. And as I got older, there were periods in my life where I certainly wasn't at one with myself. And, you know, I've traveled um, at times a very dark path um, and a shadow land. And I think actually, that has been a gift to me now. Um, and I thought, and I'm at one with the natural world. And the only way that I can describe that overall integral sense of all of those things is beauty. And then I really sat with that. And I thought, that is, that is, that is the call for me to go home. That's what I need to look for. And, and exploring it within do design in terms of what did that mean as a, as a human being, um, as a spiritual person, as a creative person, as a maker, 
Um, what does that mean in terms of my experience of the projects that I've run, um, the way that one leads? Um, what does it mean in terms of the moral compass of the purpose of business and why businesses should be in this world? And I think that that to me was a real reclaiming of, you know, when I was working with, you know, artists um, designing catalogs or books for them or whatever it was I was doing, essentially I felt I was really bringing something of value into the world that was sharing that idea and that insight um, or whatever it was. Um, and I also had seen, you know, in my journey, um, what happens again when and people don't lead with generosity um, when people um, aren't prepared to be open and compassionate and to use empathy as part of their practice and their daily lives, um, to watch people suffer through uh, the political shape of an organisation or watch an organisation damage itself because it's so arrogant, it doesn't believe that actually nothing bad can happen to it. And actually what it believes is, is that the more it takes from its own personnel or from the world or from the planet, they're doing really good. And, um, and I just felt this, uh, this binary way of looking at the world, you know, you're either doing good, so you're a tree hugger, um, you know, or you're in business and you've got to, you know, be this big, bad, you know, human being, because that's just, it's only business. And, you know, I would say to people that when you use that term, it's only business, what you're saying is, I'm actually giving myself this idea of I can do anything to anybody in the world without any form of integrity whatsoever. And to me, that is utterly unacceptable. Um, it's and, and, and. You can do the good thing, you can create the cool thing, and you can do good at the same time, you know, and if you're not in that kind of part of how we want the world to be right now, then you shouldn't be in business as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, that came out so clear on the journey. And, and also, uh, you know, you know, talk about um, uh, uh, bike company and axe company, and you you uh, talk about some really beautiful things there. And, and it's definitely one that even though we're talking about your other book, I want people to go back and get that one and, and definitely read it. It's uh, available in all formats, audio, ebook, and then physical book as mm. well. And um, it, it, it's a nice, I, I found it a nice preparation, more insight into who you are in this long journey you've taken with many different types of businesses. And, and you, you also have a plethora, a library of, of other wisdoms and knowledge that you that you have online, either interviews or, or your blog or your newsletter, which are, are really wonderful transitions on to give people the tools and the knowledge and the wisdom. But you also offer some other things that, that are really nice. So if people want to go in a deeper dive and, and a little more substance, you, you do these nice walking discussions walk and talk type of ex, uh, experience very very personal um and, and you really cater to to whatever the need the individual but also if it's an organization or a company leader that uh, yeah i mean i think that um so the walk with me uh is you come you know you come come to my house and we'll walk out in the fen for two hours um the floor is yours in a sense uh, what comes up comes up i mean I've written a bunch of books. These are the things I've done. You know, the framework is beauty. But actually, what I'm very interested in is, um, as you know, in both books, I really talk about the individual as well. And um, I, I, on those walks, I really want to listen to the whole person. Um, we aren't, again, made into silos. You know, we're a very complex, messy um, piece of equipment um, as a human being. And so... Those walks are uh, a really profound uh, deep dive into what is really going on inside somebody. And, you know, that could be, um, uh, yeah, I mean, everything from um, talking about uh, one's background, love, trauma, 
uh, guilt, shame, uh, struggles with uh, maybe leadership, right through to um, uh, patent strategies, um, innovation ideas, uh, whatever. And what people say is, is that, um, and what's interesting is the walking is, is this incredible container. It's a technology in a sense. I mean, there's a reason why there are pilgrim routes all over the world, I think. Um, um, although, you know, mine isn't based within a, a religious context, but um, walking is a creative exercise. Um, when you walk with each other, you're, you're equal, you're in synchrony with each other. Um, there's a lot of listening that goes on. Um, you create a really interesting container of trust. Um, and if none of that works, you've had a really good two hour walk anyway. So you've had a bit of a workout. Um, and lots and lots of people say to me that they've never been able to have that type of conversation with, with anyone quite the, in the same way. You know, I'm not a trained psychotherapist. I'm not a trained coach. It's just, this is me. This is my lifetime's experience now as a 57 year old man um and i'm really happy to put my vulnerability on the table as well and if if whatever has happened is useful in terms of helping you reflect and, and move on from where you are that would be useful and so it is actually really important and in that sense i'm in service to that human being um and the most important thing is as they come away really feeling that they've really been able to explore something fundamentally important for, for them. You know, I, I really don't mind what that is. I mean, some people want to ask me about how did I learn to write? How do I start writing? You know, what is the creative practice or process? And I'm very happy to go down that road as well because that's been part of what I do. In terms of then the really professional stuff um, with, with uh, businesses, business leaders and organizations, uh, we are working currently on setting up a school, um, which is really exciting. And I've got some great conversations going on with that with some folks. Um, but um, in between all of that, uh, we run two day seminars, we run six part deep dive programs. Again, the way that I work, however, is it has to be very relational and it has to be intimate. So I won't run a program to say a hundred people because we won't learn that way for me learning is through in a sense back to the walking thing is every time we walk we walk out i don't know what we're going to talk about so each one is is a journey of inquiry and i believe in the way that i've also written the books or the way that i approach my work is i'm not saying to people be like me um i'm not saying these are the seven habits of a highly successful person i'm saying here's a framework here is a way of maybe looking at and thinking about the world. I can bring in uh, a ph philosophical framework because I believe profoundly that the way you pick up a tool is the way that you will use it in the, in the, in the same way, which is the language which we choose to use and the language which we choose not to use, right? And we've seen that a lot uh, in uh, both uh, in North America and in the UK and other parts of Europe where certain people have decided that they want to use a certain type of language which is framed in anger and is, is spoken with hate. And that does some profoundly bad things to people. So for me, that deep philosophical framing is really important in terms of then how we want to bring things to the world. Then there are the tools um, in terms of what it is we're going to make and how we're going to make it. Um, and that to me... All of those things have to be connected up together. You can't, you can't unhitch one thing from, from the rest. Um, uh, and all of that can be achieved by using really simple, plain, but poetic language as best we can. And I think just kind of building on from that, because it comes to my mind now, um, somebody once asked me uh, when do build... Uh, do design first came out and they said, you know, what does the language of beauty give the world of sustainability? You know, and it's like, they got me in a corner and I said, well, you know, it's really simple. Um, we all as human beings um, understand the universal language of beauty, not that it's a thought uh, language, it's a felt language. Um, 
beauty is about joy. It's about wonder. Um, it's about transcendence. Um, it's about um, really understanding the fundamental difference between doing the right thing or the wrong thing, doing the beautiful thing. Um, it's the oxygen. It's the lifeblood of what a better life can look like. And that is why when we walk out into the natural world, you know, um, it speaks to us. Because what that says is when that grass is green or the flowers are blooming, you know, or the sea is kind of, you know, looking at you, glimmering and glinting, all of that is saying to you is life can thrive here. And I said the language of sustainability is a completely different language and it's a totally different metaphor. Um, I said, you know, I'm a musician and I can play what is called a sustaining note on my guitar but I can't hold that note forever. And so what you're saying to me is, is that I'm hanging on by my fingernails. You're telling me I've got to stop doing stuff. You're telling me that you know, my life as I've known it is over, that I can't have fun, that it can't be joyful. You know? and, it, and it's got this kind of moral kind of finger pointing thing, which I said makes people feel really uncomfortable. Now I said, I'm a fully signed up member of uh, you know, what we need to do. But I said, we have got to describe a better world for people. And I said, you know, that is where I think sustainability is this abstract metaphor for a lot of people. And what we've got to do is we've got to be profoundly good storytellers um, and to make those stories feel really rooted in, I can participate in um, this journey of profound transformation. I have a role to play. It doesn't matter whether I'm one or whether we're many. It's how can I contribute? And these are the things to me which I think are really uh, essential, which changes the, the framework of sustainability and then this world of creating something which is more beautiful. And that's what I think we need to reclaim. Absolutely. I love it. So your website is beautiful.business. So yep. you live and breathe uh, beautiful and beauty and everywhere else. I have a good friend, Tim Leberecht. He wrote the book, A Business Romantic. You pro probably know him as well mm -hmm. um, from Hamburg, Germany, uh, but w lived in San Francisco for a long time in California. <clears throat> um, that whole principle or those ways of looking at the world through a different lens of, of who you work with, how you work, what the beauty is and, and all you do uh, in daily life uh, is, is really, uh, I hate to say, it, but it's a, it's a successful systemic uh, type of model for life. It's one that really also goes back to the golden rule, treat people and planet how you would like to be treated, you know, and the, 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 the from the, the fruits of your labors and the fruits of, uh, of that tree, you'll know, you know, from the fruits, you can tell what, what that business is and does. And, and I, I love that the way you express that and, and how that is. In your second book, and even in the first, you touch more and in, in, in do build this, philosophy or principle of, of that model is really, or that framework is really regenerative or mm. regeneration. Yeah. Uh, uh, am, am I correct by that? I mean, that's kind of, there, there is a framework or a way of thinking in that way that that, yeah. that sets the, the tone. Absolutely. So um, uh, the way that I kind of uh, unpack that for people, which is, um, the laws of the universe are described to be beautiful. Einstein's theory of relativity, Paul Dirac's theory of how subatomic particles will dance with each other over huge distances and things. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, the artist Anselm Kiefer said, you know, when God, uh, um, you know, uh, when God created the, the world, um, uh, you know, or when a star explodes, um, you know, he doesn't waste a single atom. Um, and um, what I kind of argue is, is that nature uh, within all of that has been running the longest R&D project we've ever known. 
Um, and in fact, her purpose is to support the needs of all life. Um, and, you know, as I said, uh, as, as, as Anselm sort of made it in his own in his own words, but nature doesn't waste a single atom. Um, nature's got a very long horizon line. Uh, and, you know, if we want to be around for a little bit longer, um, let's just say perhaps an eternity, because nature's horizon line, as I said, is very long and uh, she's worked that out, then we've got to start learning from that playbook. Um, we've got to work from the playbook of regeneration. Um, you know, nature doesn't go and plunder a single species. Um, it doesn't go and plunder anything in the world where it, it, it completely destroys it. Um, you know, it works as, as we know, as a, as a very, very complicated ecosystem from the very, very large to the very, very small. Um, nature doesn't, uh, you know, nature understands the limits of growth. Um, you know, if she didn't, then we just wouldn't be here, I don't think. Um, and so we've got to redefine what that idea of, of you know, growth means. Um, and that's where I think this question um, of the role of business within that mindset has fundamentally, you know, got to change. There's uh, in the book, I talk about the 19th uh, century critic and social thinker, John Ruskin. Um, and he kind of said, look, if we want to focus on what will sustain us for an eternity, perhaps we need to rethink about what we create a gifts bestowed upon the world, you know. Um, and with businesses, what I say, therefore, is, is that you've got to reflect on what type of world you're trying to make, build and create you know, and consider, reconsider, you know, the social purpose of making, you know, whether it's a vineyard, a bank, an energy company, a farm, a trainer brand, you know, how does that matter to the world? Um, and they're the sort of fundamental sort of parts of the framing at the beginning of why I titled the book, How to Make a Leader Business the World Needs, where the emphasis is on the word need as opposed to the word want. I absolutely love that. And so I, I, I have been speaking about regeneration, mainly regenerative agriculture for a long, long time. Mm. And uh, in the past few years, it's moved more into regenerative organics and, and regenerative practices. But just in since the end of uh, 2020 um, and this year alone, I've already given um, 17 different talks about regenerative uh, um, uh, economies, regenerative medicine, regenerative capitalism. Um, there is a, a new book called Green Swans by John Elkington, fabulous yep. book, also talks about regenerative capitalism. Paul Hawkins' books, Natural Capitalism and, uh, and others also have that regenerative principle in it, and they're, they're fairly older books as well. Mm. Um, but there a lot of people when they hear this and i'll tell you uh, two, uh, uh, one big organization that i spoke with uh, this year at, at their conferences in yokohama uh, japan and in kuala lumpur malaysia and in uh, in thailand was sustainable brands and their theme for this entire year of, of their talks and that is on regenerative and regeneration mm. uh, obviously uh, but the organization, those brands that were coming to the table, they're like, okay, so we went from, from sustainability to corporate social responsibility to environmental social governance. And, and, and now we're hearing this new word regenerative and they're uh, like, all of them looked at me and they said, okay, Mark's going to talk about regenerative agriculture. That's what, that's what he's here to talk about. No, I'm absolutely was not there. It was about, regenerative economies, that whole philosophy, that framework of, of regeneration. It's, it's, uh, it's the endless re-imperatives almost that tie into this closed system, circular economy, one planet living framework of regenerative thinking and practices and way of viewing the world. And you so eloquently just just said that uh, in, in in your kind of summation of the frameworks that you use in your discussion and working with these businesses. But that leads me to 
to this bigger overarching question. And I, I kind of want to tie it into this global citizen. Um, we're all we're all distant cousins type of philosophy. Mm. Um, do you how, how do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world where there were no nations and borders or divisions of humanity or species one from another? Mm. And more so, do you believe that this regenerative operating system, this regenerative framework is one that can work for the entire world? Uh, well, absolutely. I think uh, the regenerative framework needs to work for the entire world. Um, we've seen the damage of what an extractive economy does. And in many respects, you know, I think that um, I've been thinking a lot about race just recently for a variety of, of different reasons. Um, we in, in Britain um, cannot come to terms with our colonial past. And I was actually watching a program on the TV yesterday about the Black Power movement um, here in the UK. It appalls me at how, um, you know, these people were asked to come from, we're talking Windrush now, to come from, you know, the colonial islands of the Caribbean to help Britain rebuild after the war. Um, and what they experienced was, was appalling. Um, that's an extractive philosophy and mindset. And of course, America has its own unique problems because it will not deal with the reality of its slavery um, and its past as a consequence of that. Um, in terms of myself, um, I'm only an Englishman when England play rugby uh, at an international level. Um, that's kind of when I sort of, you know, would wear the red rose. But, you know, I've been gifted with, um, in my lifetime, uh, to travel extensively around the world. And what I see is, is that all human beings want the same things. Um, you know, they want a roof over their head. They want to feel that they can turn on the taps and there's clean water that runs, there's heating, there's enough provision for them, essentially. And they want to feel that there's progress in their lives, whatever that may look like. And of course, that's all kind of, you know, wrapped up in different types of cultural ways of sort of looking at the world. But I can tell you that my lenses really shifted, you know, quite early on in my life having sort of, you know, lived and worked abroad extensively. It's quite interesting how things, again, you know, change quite profoundly, but they're very subtle. So I am a citizen of the world. And, you know, uh, Theresa May, our ex-Prime Minister, said, you know, um, those sorts of people are citizens of nowhere. And I, I completely think that's, a, you know, again, that's politics uh, playing out. Um, uh, and I think that uh, there is um, a very different type of, uh, generation, I mean, not not at my age, but, you know, half my age, where they see the world fundamentally in a very, very different type of way. You know, uh, some of us are just trying to do our best to be better custodians of maybe what comes next and to sort of, you know, um, plough that furrow. That said, um, you know, place and culture are important for people. Um, and in the same way that you know, nature thrives because she is diverse. We have to celebrate that diversity. What we should do is to be open to the idea that there are different cultures and customs, there are different religions. Um, um, and I think that left alone to our own devices, um, people will work out how to rub along, um, you know, shoulder cheek by jowl. I mean, come to London, all right, it's not perfect, but there are over like 270 languages spoken in London on a daily basis. Um, our world has been enriched by people traveling and moving and settling in different parts of the world in terms of writing, food, music, you know, you name it. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, America, but, you know, Steve Jobs came from Syria um, and he was an orphan, right? So if he wasn't brought there, you wouldn't have Apple, perhaps. Uh, and people are very myopic in, in those things for a variety of different reasons. Um, Lastly on that, what I think I'd like to say is, is that also back to this idea of an extractive economy, 
um, we were told that a free market principle would allow money to flow freely into all the right places for all the right reasons. Um, but actually one third of the wealth of this world is now held in offshore tax havens. Um, the model doesn't work. And what we've seen is since the global financial crisis and even before that, the, you know, the middle class has stalled around the world. That's really, really dangerous. It's politically and socially dangerous. So, and even when I wrote No Straight Lines in 2000, and, well, published in 2011, I said, we are at the adaptive edge of our industrial society and we face Houston, a major design challenge. And if we don't fix it, then something really, really bad is going to happen, which is why the book was called No Straight Lines, right? Making sense of our non-linear world. And here we are in a very, very non-linear world. So we either get on with the business of regenerating planet and societies, um, respecting diversity and all of those things, or in fact, actually, we don't actually have a very good um, outcome um, is, is what we're looking at. And I don't like to be a doomster and a gloomster. You know, as you, we said, what we need to do is we need to say, there's a great universe, there's a great economy uh, that we can create, but we have to frame it within those principles of regeneration, which goes right back, as we know, to, you know, indigenous first nation, uh, you know, uh, philosophies and ideas of the idea of equilibrium and respect um, and reciprocity, reciprocity, sorry, I struggle with that word, uh, reciprocity. Um, these are the things that we have to think about um, in terms of reinvigorating um, a world that's going to be better for all. Definitely in both of your books, and uh, there is no doomster, gloomster at all. I feel very positive upspin mm. on all of it, and it's very optimistic, and there's a lot of tools and, and good examples that, that, that I really like. So just so my reader listeners know, when they read the book, they can be, uh, they'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of taking a little bit down of some, some negative things where we have to tickle the surface of some negativity. In, in what you just uh, mentioned about the extractive, uh, um, extractive economies and extractive way of thinking, um, you, you mentioned there's a limit to growth. Well, that comes from the book, The Limits to Growth, Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, Your Grander, Steve Barron's which is considered the, the climate, climate science Bible, so to say, it's from MIT and uh, written in 1972. Um, that, that's this original kind of sy not only systems thinking, but putting the world together, out, getting out of this linear way of looking, getting out of the siloed approach and seeing what's this, uh, where, where are we headed um, based on the world model three computer modeling and stuff at all. You also, uh, j just in case my listeners aren't, aren't aware how that ties in this productive economy and into where we're going with this regenerative model, but also in, in, in um, Do Build, you, you, um, you mentioned the civilization frameworks and you don't really get into it a lot, but I, but I do. So, and, and I kind of want to touch on, on, on um, the existing models that we have in our world, whether in they're in the U.S. Or, or in the United Kingdom or different, they're they're not working for us anymore. We have more disease, uh, unrest. Uh, we have more strife amongst each other, and we're politically we're disappointed that they're not really our, our governments, our politicians are not delivering uh, the futures. Uh, that we would like and that we're, we're kind of trying to find out some other models and this the the civilization frameworks that we have right now are <clears throat> kind of and i don't know this might be a question for you is do you feel that there is this disease this ease in the current civilization frameworks that we we see and we feel on our planet now that that they're on the verge of strife or conflict or collapse that they're just not working for us all around the world as global citizens and i guess the example i would take is there's over well over 
20 different civilization framework models that have existed in the past, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztec, Mayas, Greeks, Romans, on and on. And all but two of those 20 civilization frameworks collapsed because of ecological or environmental collapse, and we're just left with their ruins. Mm. Um, how can we not feel with a crazy, sorry, shit that's going on around the world with different frameworks that we couldn't be, because we have computers, uh, that we're not going to face a collapse or that we don't need some kind of a better model to transition to? I, yeah, I'd like I mean, to I get more into that discussion with you. Definitely. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, for sure. I mean, I think that again, you know, right back to writing those straight lines, um, and the seven years that was the sort of research, you know, up to that, you could really see the damage that was being done to people by the destruction of their communities, um, and uh, the um, the way in which actually that then had a huge psychological impact uh, on on people and the nature of work on top of that, because I was very interested in the rise of fundamentalism and um, and I mean that in its broadest possible spectrum. Um, and uh, you know what happens is if people can't create meaningful identity and a sense of uh, belonging um, within the world that they exist in then they become uh, machines in the ghost called life. Um, and um, that is in part what we have seen um, today because that is driven through fear and anger. Um, and this is where the, we need a very different type of leadership, which is based on uh, an essential kind of component of... Um, nurture of a society um, you know the reality is human beings are designed to work collaboratively together i mean that is that is our that is our design um, as much as people might think that you know there's a great there's a great story actually when um uh, when ali muhammad ali was being interviewed by michael parkinson who was a very famous talk show host you know again back in uh you know back in the day and i think i was a 10 year old boy at the time and uh, ali and parky got on very well with each other and he said to ali he said uh, ali you write poetry don't you and ali said yes i do he said what's your shortest poem and he went me we and i just thought that was great and um that links actually into carl jung's work which is i need we to truly be i you know um and what we've got currently however in terms of i don't know your you know your civilization framework is the othering uh politicians are using the othering um to lay blame um, and to create victimhood in people uh which is catastrophic in what it's doing um because all they want to do is get into power um and that, in a sense, is why at the moment I've said the means by which we transform our world is through the process of business. It's not through political leadership. Um, I think ultimately we need both. Um, I'd like to, for there to be both. But I think that for me, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just, you know, Jared Diamond, who wrote the book Collapse and Guns, Germ yeah, and Steel, yeah. right? And um, there's a great quote, which is when civilizations fall, the only thing that is left is art. Um, and so for me, I suppose, yeah, the reframing is, is um, what is the contribution that you are going to make to the world? You know, the first thing I want to think about, you know, how do you serve society? What is the societal interest that you are currently serving? So you could say, for example, we need a company like Uber, or we need a service like Uber, but we don't need uh, a business run like Uber is run because they're not serving societal interest in terms of contribution in the way that they are going about those things. Now, a friend of mine says that's fixable. And I said, well, it shouldn't be fixable in the first place. It shouldn't have to go to the high court in London, you know, to say that actually these guys are, you know, it's a, it's a form of indentured slavery, basically, right? Um, 
we've got to think about our social impact, our environmental impact. Um, we've got to move from, you know, this idea of exponential growth to understanding that, you know, there needs to be a circular go. So what are we measuring? You know, are we measuring carbon capture? Are we measuring regeneration? Are we measuring well-being, which is actually part of what New Zealand does as part of its KPI in terms of its, its way that it evolves and develops, which is why I put them in the book, uh, because they are a business, they are administered, people are paid to administer the nation state, right? And to think about those things. And what I'm saying is, is that that civilization framing needs to be based on a very different type of KPI, uh, key performance indicator. Um, that whole idea about moving from short term to long term, this is also, I think, a, a really fundamental problem. So if you look at, say, VC, for example, or innovation, you're looking at funds which are, say, you know, 10 years maximum in terms of their horizon line. And as one of the guys uh, that I interviewed in the book, Jan Wurzbacher, who set up Climeworks, you know, which are building these incredible machines to suck huge quantities of carbon dioxide out of the year, you know, billions of tons, because that's what we need to do. He said, all of our money has come from private individuals because their horizon line is completely different. You cannot build a regenerative business on a 10 year program, right? And that to me is also very important. And what we've got is, is a political system pretty much around the world, which is not prepared to actually entrust the idea that you could be laying foundations for the greater good of all society that you are in service to over say, you know, a 25 year, 50 year period or a hundred year period or kind of whatever. Um, but these are the things are uh, the sort of uh, the reconfiguring um, that I think that we that we need, and we need to go back to the idea of really you know community is important. Um, again, the conversation I was having with uh, someone the other day in the states. I mean, I've travelled extensively to America, and uh, you know, no offence, but um, in terms of the you know, I think we were talking about I don't know. Uh, the economy there and I, I've, I've just got a picture of a massive walmart in my head i've got a picture of a massive walgreens you know but they still talk about main street but it's like these things are really important in terms of the fabric of what makes a community work and thrive at a, at a micro micro scale um and again back to that idea of cultures um what do we think about culture how do we nurture them rather than actually how do we create division through them. Um, and these are sort of the, the framing things that I think are, are very important uh, of what we look at. And I think finally, I mean, in terms of governance for business, it's like you've got to really think about maybe how you set your organization up. Um, of course, B Corp is popular, but there's lots and lots of other um, types of organization where actually you can say we will you know, ensure that the sovereignty of our organization and its integrity is protected uh, because there will be some folks which will want to come along and say, I'm sorry, but it's just only business. Um, and yeah. they won't have your best intentions at heart when they say that. Um, I know that for a fact, um, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I, does, I does that, that answer your question? Uh, absolutely answers my question. And you brought up that so nicely uh, that... There's um, ingrained in the core business models or vision of an organization. It's really not only these regenerative uh, uh, principles and framework, but it, it's also the fact that the, these organizations are are like an organ. You know, there are multiple parts of this organism. Uh, an organ. Uh, organs of an organism, so to say, but th that they are addressing a lot around planetary services or doing things to leave the planet or their reach of environment that they touch or their services better than they found it type of type of thinking and principles, which I really see in that. And, in, and I don't want to, I mean, we've teased quite a bit on your book. So, and, and it's, it's not a, 
a hard or difficult read. It's not, uh, it's not too thick, but it's to the point and it's concise. And at the end, there's just a beautiful manifesto. Um, and, and I want to encourage everybody to, to go get it, to read it. Um, I do want to ask, are you eventually also going to do an audio version of it as well? Um, yes. I mean, if Miranda uh, asks me to uh, do an audio version of Do Build, then I will. I mean, there is an audio version of Do Design, as, yes, you, as yes. you know. I mean, just to put those two things together, I mean, in, uh, in Do Design, I talk about the philosophy of Ing. Um, because beauty is a verb, right? Not a noun, because that, that describes the animacy of life. And that language to me is really important. And I just put a list of things together, which are, you know, banging, weaving, coving, coding, loving, you know, leading, whatever, but the ing, so that you can put beauty into every fab, every part of your everyday life in a whole variety of different ways. And that's where you know, I want people to configure themselves, which is, it starts with me, it starts with me on the inside, but actually then I can bring that to the outside in a whole variety of ways, um, which is absolutely important. Then with the manifesto of re, you know, it's back to that idea of um, re-everything. Um, so the reimagining, the re-engineering, the redesign, the remaking, all of these things in the manifesto, I'm saying you can be part of doing that. And that's where we start to get into a, a movement uh, and, um, and have some momentum and energy where that is happening. I mean, you know, the, uh, I mean, Paul Hawkin, as you said, who wrote the most amazing review of the book. And I have to say, actually, the story was, is, um, you know, I'd, Paul and I sort of know each other. Um, I wouldn't say we're great friends, but, you know, we've known each other for a while. And I asked him whether he would look at the manuscript and uh, give me his thoughts. And, uh, you know, he said he was incredibly busy, uh, but send it anyway. Uh, and then one Saturday morning, actually, I was out in the out in the fen walking and my phone pings. And it's an email from Paul. And I read what he wrote. And I have to say that... Uh, uh, I kind of teared up a little bit um, because it meant so much to me that he wrote those really just incredible words. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm getting a bit emotional now about it, yeah, but um, that's okay. It, I would get know, emotional you know, as well. I'm um, I'm a big it, fan of Paul, but I, but because and it's because of his work, his whole life, and and not only Smith and Hawking tools and and gardening and kind of the the journey he's taken. You know, I've got two copies of the draw, drawdown on my shelf, but yep. it's just genuine beauty and business, genuine ways to make the planet a better place, to, to draw down, to offer services, to get us to a better future. And so when someone uh, not only recommends your book like that, but also says such beautiful things about it, I, I would get emotional as well yeah. because things that he touches and, 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 and has done in the past. And, and a lot of people don't know about his past books. They only know about the drawdown. And I, I'm, I'm like, are, are you yeah. insane? This this guy's been doing this for for decades. And um, yeah. he, uh, it's just, a, just yeah. a great person. Yeah. 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 I mean, what I want to say is also, is I think the, I mean, in terms of the book, as you know, there's, um, I've put an appendix uh, in the back of 49 businesses that I believe to be beautiful because the 50th one is you um and uh, that's an invitation and a, and a provocation but um as i said i've uh what i want to show is just that um uh you know buckminster fuller wrote that great book about you know how to fly spaceship earth and i suppose uh, i'm saying this is another way of thinking about how we can fly our spaceships um but equally that um, you know you could be a country you could be a city you know, you could be a big business, but you could be a one man ceramicist, which is also I have in the book, because it for me, it's that philosophy, which is, you know, Suetsu Yanagi, the very famous ceramicist, uh, you know, talked about beauty in the everyday or William Morris, you know, founded the arts and crafts movement, which said have nothing in your house that you believe to be neither useful nor beautiful. Um, and that to me is extremely important just to just to sort of make that point so that I think anyone a bit like do design and I wrote it to sort of to be as open as accommodating with um, a universal language that people could each you know could could get something 
out of this book that would help them in terms of their own, you know, journey, whatever that, that may be. And that to me uh, was extremely important because what I do say is, is that, you know, we need as many beautiful leaders and makers in this world as we can possibly get, you know, so it's not about me. It's not about, you know, uh, the I, it's about how can I be in service to the we, because I think we need that right now more than we possibly can. Um, and that, in a sense, was, you know, a big part of the mission um, of the book. Yeah, Do Design was taking me home and Do Build is really kind of going, right, so now we need to get really mission focused in terms of you know you you know the, the work that you guys are doing with your moonshot thing with the innovation you know we've we've really got to shoot for that and we've got to be unreasonable about it um and we've got to be we've got to defy the orthodoxy um i mean lastly what i would say to that also however is you know there is a real sea change happening right now um people are really starting to understand that we can't continue as business as usual of course there will be some that will want to continue as business as usual because they're powerful um, and uh, their model of extraction um, has worked for them so they're not going to want to learn to use you know a new framework um, but unfortunately i think their days are numbered um, I, I agree there's uh, a huge appetite for change um, it, you may not read it on the front pages of the national new papers on a daily basis because their, you know, their business model is doom and gloom, and uh, you know that sells more newspapers. But I can tell you from the work that I've done, there are some amazing people on this planet. A lot of them that are really invested in bringing the good into the world. You know, I love I love the companies that you listed. I'm also friends uh, with Climbworks and uh, uh, one of their uh, original. Um, sponsors and still still helping them matter of fact um i flew, flew in the first uh 100 carbon neutral uh airbus converted helicopter very experimental into davos 2020 um uh with climbworks um it, they're doing crazy amazing things and, and uh, it was very uh, you know so not only was it running on hydrogen jet fuel but then it had a retrofit uh, uh, direct air capture thing, converting whatever emissions were to come out. So it was, it was amazing, but, um, there are some great organizations you have listed there. And I, I think that, that there's a lot of hope for and, and optimism in all this. I, I, I have a few more questions for you before we uh, are even close to wrapping up and one of them's a little bit the, the i guess the last plug for the do lectures the do books the do events because this is such a great organization i mean mm -hmm. i went in and looked at the events that they do not only the types of speakers but the environment and the beauty and the, the connections that you see on those people is very in line and congruent with with how you function and work that's very individualized personalized and that there's this this, this nice exchange of just the brightest minds and, and beautiful people as well can you tell us a little bit more how how you got in that and how that's evolved and kind of give us some more positive yeah sure well i mean you know dave dave hire and claire dave and claire um Hire are the co-founders of the Do Lectures, and um, actually Dave and I go back to 2001. And uh, actually, I met him. Uh, he founded a company initially called Howies, which eventually was sold to to somebody else. And um, I had just come back to the UK after being abroad for quite some time. We connected. Uh, I went down to see him, and actually that week he was literally selling. They'd sold their house in London. Um, and was moving down to Cardigan Bay uh, to set up Howie's. Um, and, um, and then a, a while later, you know, Dave said, look, I'm starting to do this thing called the Do Lectures, um, you know, doers of the world, inspiring, inspiring others to go and do, you know, great stuff. Uh, would you like to come and talk? And I said, of course, I'd love to come and talk. And um, so I went down to Cardigan Bay and, uh, you know, I gave a talk, which was 2009, actually. I mean, that was like uh, a long time ago. But yes, I mean, you know, over the years, they've evolved and developed that 
into an amazing place. And what was interesting, I think, is when you think about constraint of design. So I think that it's about 80 people that initially went to the do lectures. And I think it was only 80 because that was the biggest tent they had available to get people in, right? Which I kind of really like. But what they realized was is the intimacy of you know, speakers um, and the people turning up uh, to listen to the lectures uh, became something incredibly special. Um, and they really kept on that. Um, and, uh, and I salute Dave for, for doing that. And of course, you know, he went off and then uh, set up uh, Hyatt Denim, um, which has been an incredibly successful company um, with a great backstory, uh, um, which, uh, which, I, which I love. And then, um, you know, a while later, um, Miranda uh, West set up the, the Do uh, Book Company. And it's a very simple deal, which is you only get to do a do book if you've done a do, le do lecture. So I'm probably very lucky that Dave invited me to come and do a do lecture back in 2009. Um, and um, yeah, you know, it's a great series. Um, I think they've built a great brand. I think it's framed with that whole idea about uh, bringing some sort of positivity, practical, practical, but it's grounded stuff. You know, it's not... It's not, um, I mean, all of those people that write the books, that give the lectures, they are all doing some really, uh, you know, great stuff uh, in the world. I mean, sadly, you know, they, they've, um, they've not been able to run the festival for two years. They won't run it this year either, because I think David believes, as, as Claire, that the magic is not online in the same way. The magic is now these 150 people that come to this, this farm in in Wales and you know it's the time where people come together eat together play together you know all of that dialogue that's what makes it absolutely special um and yeah I, I you know I feel immensely privileged to um be part of that of that community um uh you know I can't speak highly enough of Miranda as a publisher I mean she's a really tough taskmaster sometimes and uh, you know uh, there are days when uh, you know as we've been working on this project uh, you know that's been that's been hard but that's fine because she knows that I'm absolutely committed to making the best possible products I want to make and I know that she's absolutely committed to making the best possible product she can make and that gives it its best chance to be out there in the world and you've got that again a really personal engagement with someone um, working in a publishing company and um, I know that not every writer uh, gets that type of experience from their from their publisher right so yeah, um, that's beautiful so yeah you know um, they're uh, they're small books but they pack a punch I think is what they I would say for sure do and uh, I absolutely love them and I have a few of the other ones as well and they're just they're just really wonderful. I have now my last four questions uh, for you. Um, this is probably the hardest one that you'll receive from me today. It's <laughs> it's actually uh, and I and I have high expectations coming from you. Um, it's the burning question, WTF, and that's not the one we've been asking ourselves these last twelve months. It's really what's the future. I'd like to know your vision of what's the future. Well, um, I'm not sure I can uh, I can predict that. I can say that if we are um, prepared to reframe our world within the concept of being regenerative and all that that means then we have a really bright future in front of us. Uh, I do think that it could well be that things get a little bit rockier before they get better. Um, one of the reasons why I say that is, is actually there used to be an organization called GBN, Global Business Network, um, and that was founded by Stuart Brand and um, Peter Schwartz and uh, some other folks. And in 1999, Peter came to Sweden where I was working at the time 
and gave a seminar. And for some reason, I was invited to this thing. I have no idea why I was, you know, that's back in the midst of time. Um, but uh, GBN um, was really based on this idea of deep scenario planning about the future of the world, um, which came actually out of Royal Dutch Shell. And actually that came out of military planning in the Second World War. Um, and um, uh, what he said was, is that over the coming 20 years, there would be a, uh, a war or a battle or battle between a fundamentalist view of the world and a more progressive view of the world. And even back in the day then, you know, there was already this sort of, you know, uh, a sort of more East-West religious kind of tension that was going on. Um, and so I put my hand up um, and I said, are you talking about this sort of, you know, a fundamental war between, you know, religions? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, it's not. It's, it's about there are people in this world that want to stop where uh, society wants to go. Um, and they have a fundamental view of the world that they want to control it. But he said, human nature is not like that. You cannot stop its progression. And as I said, um, if I believe in what I said earlier in the talk, which is uh, cooperation is our superpower, um, then what we do is, is we, at a mimetic level, I think we stop, we think, uh, and we say, and there'll be 51% of us as opposed to 49% to say, we'd like to be around for a bit longer. What do we need to do to make that happen? And that's where I think we have an optimistic future that we can look into. You know, that's not to say um, it breaks my heart to see the damage that we've done to societies, to people of race and religion and to the planet. Um, we need to grow up a little bit, I think. Um, and leaders need to grow up in terms of actually being, to, to lead properly. Um, and that's not to say, well, we need to respond to the media or whatever else. We need to say this is where we need to get to and these are the reasons why we need to get to it. Um, but if we do those things, and I do think we have a better and more optimistic future ahead of us. These last three questions are really for sustainable takeaways from my guests. By, by the way, your answer was absolutely correct. You got, you got it right. But, but I also see for you personally as that answer that you gave to the question that um, you, you gave your individual, but you also got, gave this world perspective of what the, what the future is. In the model, just in our discussion and what I've read in the book and what I've seen online from you, you, you live a very uh, regenerative uh, uh, um, Type of lifestyle, the way you do business, the way you live, uh, is is that that's that's your model for the future, and I think it's one that will take you very far because I consider you for sure among that fifty one percent. The question is really, if there was one message you could impart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? Your message. I think it's um, a very simple one, which is how can I contribute to a better world? Um, and and that what I do has to matter. So in the at the end of the book, you know, there's 13 design questions that I formulated by looking at lots of different uh, organizations and businesses. Does it matter to the world? Does it matter to me? Does it matter to my team? does it matter and i call it the mattering and that is the one thing that you really need to ask yourself because it's like when i wrote the design that was the question i asked um and that is where the journey towards beauty started on for me so it's a big question i love it what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a difference or a real impact well, I mean, I think that the, the question from them is, um, how do I bring equilibrium um, through ecology and economy and society through the innovations that I create, um, you know, from start to finish? Uh, what does that mean in terms of supply chain, uh, end product service? What does that mean as a business model, which is why Climeworks is, you know, a, plays a principal role uh, within, within the storytelling of the book, because... Um, 
they set themselves no easy task, those two young men, um, to bring that transformation into the world. And back to that thing about be unreasonable, uh, be a great storyteller. You've got to be able to tell a really, really great story, um, simply, plainly, so that everyone gets what it is. Please don't use jargon uh, and all of that kind of stuff. You know, go out there and tell a story and that makes wants everyone to be part of your journey. Um, that's what I would say to, to young innovators. Bring the good into the world. We need you. Love that. What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far in life, your professional journey, your life journey that you would have loved to know from the start? I, I know when we initially started this discussion, you said, you know, when I was seven years old, this vision of my family and just the happiness, the beauty that I felt. Mm. So you've been a thinker for quite some time and, and, uh, uh, and had some wisdom, but what, Really, what would you have liked to know from the start? That's a really profound question. Um, I think that uh, listen to your deepest, quietest, innermost voice. That is the one that speaks the loudest, and it's the one that we tend not to listen to the most sometimes when we're younger and learn to sit with that. So, in a sense, in a way, I think that giving yourself, you know, even if it's only, you know, 15 minutes reflection every day or 30 minutes reflection every day, no mobile phones, no music, no nothing, you know, just sit with yourself and listen to what is being said to you because actually you all that you need is already within you all of your potential all of your creativity you know is there and actually if you meditate and you, you know you know that what you have inside you is a vast universe it's a massive landscape and you're the only one which is privileged to journey over that sovereign land so i would say honor yourself and always say to yourself that you are good enough um, and that the world needs you as you are the best self that you can be. I wish I'd known that as a younger man, for sure. Yeah, that's so beautiful. That's all I have for you today, but I want to thank you for really letting us inside of your ideas and inside of a, a glimpse into your mind and how you think and, and uh, your ideas on the book and, and uh, these tools that really can be used and applied. Um, that's all I have for you, unless there's something you didn't get to, to let us know or say to us during our talk. No, I think I taught myself out. That was a, a, a great conversation and I really enjoyed it, Mark. And again, thank you so much for thinking of me and inviting me onto your uh, show. And I hope that uh, this conversation proves sort of uh, value to your, um, to your listeners. Yep, definitely will. Thank you so much, Alan. Have a wonderful day. Thanks very much, Mark. You too. Bye-bye.